I, I just good morning, attended... everyone. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Hello, good morning, good morning. Hello. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, welcome to the Friday SLO talk. This is uh, one uh, yet yet one more talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on on uh, assessment of student learning. As you are coming in, please don't hesitate to to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Say hello. Say good morning. Good afternoon. Whatever happens to be in your time zone. Uh, tell us what institution you are representing, and 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 if you like, share share yeah, pretty much anything you like to introduce yourself. That would be great to have you. Again, we have uh, really a lot of people who have signed up for the for the workshops. Close clo close to four hundred people, so it's it's just a staggering uh, number. But uh, just just to um, again, with, with a couple of logistics. As as always, we are making um, PowerPoint available. The chat transcript is available. The recording from the session is available, and uh, there is there is also a transcript that goes uh, behind it. So uh, those those are available. Usually, I upload them by by Sunday night. Uh, so you should you should have them either on Coach's website in the blog, or or uh, if not on Monday, you're going to receive it with the with the flyer. At the bottom of the weekly flyer, there are links to all those all those materials that I just mentioned. So please don't hesitate. Uh, take a take a look at those, um, and uh, you can you can keep them for your reference and use them at your institutions for for your own professional development uh, needs. So again, thank you very much. My name is Jarek Janio. I am uh, from Santana College uh, School of Continuing Education. Uh, I am the founder of uh, Student Learning Outcomes uh, Talks on Fridays, and I am joined by Enrique Jauregui, my colleague from uh, Fresno City College. Please, en Enrique, say hello, and then uh, turn it on to Patricia. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Enrique Jauregui. I am the SLO and outcomes coordinator for Fresno City College in the Central Valley. Welcome all. Patricia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Patty Manley, and I am from San Diego Miramar College, and I am the Program Review and Outcomes Assessment Coordinator and also History Faculty and a um, member of COACHES. I guess what do we call founding members of COACHES? <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, everyone. That's who we are. Good morning. So thank you again for joining us. And the, the first speaker today is uh, Professor Rodrigo Gomez, uh, Assistant Professor of English at San Diego Miramar College. And he's going to uh, address the issue of AI. And, and I tell you, looking at the description, there's just so many different uh, angles of the discussion that, that, that he's about to take. So please, I'll just uh, turn it over to, to Rodrigo. The floor is yours. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've shared the presentation. If you want to share it again, please do. And I saw something in the chat about no sound, so I'm not sure if I'm I'm audible or if someone was not audible. But in, in any case, um, it, my name is Professor Gomez Rodrigo Gomez. I teach at San Diego Miramar College. Uh, yeah, my presentation is a, a broad ranging presentation, and I know that there is a panel that, that will take place here conversation. Uh, so so I hope what what I say you 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 take as part of this ongoing discussion, which it sounds like has been going on. So, uh, so some of my views may come off a bit radical, but it's uh, from passionate excitement about this technology and sort of what's what's feasible. Uh, so I'll share my screen and we can just dive right in. Uh, so here is the, the presentation. Again, you have the link, uh, those of you that, that uh, found it there in the chat. So uh, AI demystified for educators, AI for education demystified is what I retitled this to, because I really wanted to focus on the educative front. Um, there is, a, a, again, a presentation that I've been doing long form. It's a five part series. It actually has the title that you see up here. So this this will be a broad overview. So uh, bear with me. A, a few fun stories are definitely involved in this presentation. So I like to start at all points with this quote, and maybe some of you are familiar with it. Uh, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, uh, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Uh, and I've, I found myself using this quote for you know, many different conversations with many different technologies. And it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a reusable quote right? whenever we have these new innovations that emerge and force us to rethink uh, some of our pedagogy, some of uh, our assessments, some of what we do in the classroom, how we uh, assess outcomes, etc. So you know, I, I leave it there for food for thought. Um, I actually have one more uh, food for thought item. So if you scan that code right there, it'll take you to the MLA CCCC Joint Task Force on Writing an AI Working Paper. 
which this presentation was was in large a part a response for at least the original presentation. Uh, this one is a sort of two-parter with the original part and then some more assessment related items since outcomes and assessment were the focus. But this paper basically tackled uh, a small joint task force, uh, their views on AI, right? The risks and benefits. And I was glad to engage this paper after I had already engaged with AI conversations, uh, talked about pedagogy, talked about possibility with other educators in other campuses, just on Twitter and other spaces where we where we socialize. So when this came around, uh, I think you'll see that we were well prepared for a lot of what they, what they deemed risks or uh, the potential downfalls of AI in the classroom. Um, so it's not to say it's a perfect conversation, a perfect solution to all the things that we have to talk about here, but it's some interesting promises, some interesting possibilities. So uh, if you scan that and you take a look at it later at your leisure, you'll also find that in my presentation, I've pulled out a lot of the, the meat, let's say, of that uh, those articles and they are addressed in the presentation. So, uh, you know, just a, a resource for you if, you would if you'd like it. Let's start with a brief definition. Uh, AI is the simulation of human intelligence through computer systems, including learning, reasoning, and self-correction. Very, very, you know, fancy definition, very complex. Not really what we're doing with AI. What we're doing with AI is prompting it to do. We're asking it to turn on our lights. <laughs> you know, we're asking it to do very basic things, but there are types of AI that we need to consider. And the three types that, that I've noted are narrow, weak AI, general, strong AI, and super or hyper AI. And a lot of this is science fiction, it, it turns out. So the two bottom ones are still being developed. They're not quite there. Uh, they're conceptual, theoretical, or right? eventually they promise to surpass human thought. Uh, for now, we're stuck at narrow and weak AI. Uh, that is what ChatGPT uh, you know, uh, very humbly even calls itself. If you ask it, what type of AI are you? Oh, I'm a weak and narrow AI. <laughs> I can only do these things, right? So uh, voice assistants, uh, Siri, Alexa, the things that we use on a constant basis, that's where AI is currently. But there is this conversation about what can it eventually do? What can it eventually lead to? And yes, development has happened with many tools. We'll, we'll sort of get there. But I just want to define, we're still at the very base of what this can become. Now, areas of use already, even in this base form, let's say, healthcare, finance, transportation are starting to be disrupted, starting to be, uh, you know, sort of fall into the scope, the umbrella of AI, right? Uh, we already know self-driving cars are on the way. Now, predictive diagnostics, I get those Instagram commercials all the time about the new type of uh, you know, healthcare center where you show up and they scan you and it's very AI powered anyway. Uh, in finance, you have algorithmic trading, you have fraud detection, you have customers already that are AI powered. Uh, in transportation, like I said a minute ago, it's, it's all sort of there. It's, it's feeding into this larger conversation. And now what we're here to talk about is AI and education. But again, in the interest of history, in the interest of really knowing what it is that, that we're talking about and not being afraid of what it can do or who it will replace or displace, I like to start at the beginning. Right, so AI conversations go back to the you know, the pre twentieth century with philosophical foundations. You know, we're talking about the Greeks and the story of Pygmalion's Galatea, right? Bringing a statue to life, right? This inanimate object given consciousness. I mean, that's where it starts for for those of us that that love you know mythology and history. Uh, jump over to the nineteen thirties, quite a leap. Uh, but we have the foundations of computational theory. You know, in the 50s, you have the birth of AI as a discipline. Now, I, I, some of this was uh, surprising to me because uh, the, the dawn of AI, as we've called it here uh, in academia, is so like, whoa, what do you mean? AI has been around for a very long time. It just wasn't really dominant at the forefront. It, it was dormant until a few months ago when ChatGPT emerged and just disrupted everything. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But you know, the 50s sees birth uh, of AI as a discipline. The 60s and 70s, we see early expansion. We have ELISA, an early natural language processing system already in, in the 70s. Uh, this one here that I always mispronounce as well. By the 80s, we have uh, a winter of AI. So technologies tend to go through these rises and falls. Uh, by the 80s, we have uh, mimic detection making human experts uh, becoming popular. Japan's fifth generation computer systems were already outpacing human minds. You know, by the time we get to the 90s, we have machine learning emerging. Uh, 
already in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue had beaten the world's best chess pl uh, player. You know, so it, it wasn't necessarily new, but it was interesting to think about, you know, we hear these things, what AI can do now. And it's like, it's been doing that for a while. Now we just have to think about how we, we apply it ourselves. So the early 2000s saw the foundations of what we, we now call modern AI and these neural networks that we're starting to use now. And in the 2010s, we had a little mini AI boom, DeepMind, AlphaGo defeated the, the world's best Go player. So now we had a leap in cognition as far as the challenge of the game. And here we are now sort of at the cusp of this going, how is this going to be integrated into our education system? Because it's already being integrated into our commercial and public systems. So this was this was one thing that I, I walked into the conference that I was able to go to, uh, ASG GSV Summit in early uh, April. And I, I was sent because of my interest in AI. And this was the chart that the keynote speaker put up. And, it, and he said it was the most important chart in 100 years. And up until this moment, up until I saw this chart, my understanding of AI was that it was something that we could curtail, that we could, you know, maybe maybe uh, protect against or, or buffer against somehow. And then I saw this and I heard his speech and I realized, oh, okay it's basically going to be integrated into everything. Now, this chart here is showing you that it was the fastest growing technology to reach you know, millions of users in a single day. What took Netflix a few, a few years to do, or, or a few days, 3,500 days, right? What it took Netflix to, to do that, ChatGPT just stopped straight up. Just got straight up to hundreds of millions. I think there was 5 million users within the first day or something. I was definitely one of those users myself, right? Trying to see what this thing was. So now to understand that that going into that conference was a different world than the one that was that was there post that conference uh, was very revelatory for me. So uh, that conference, a conversation about 100 AI companies that were already developing AI solutions, that was back in April. And all of these companies have since done so much more. You can you can look at, at a bunch of them. What are they doing? I mean, they're basically in every industry, right? Including education, by the way. So as soon as I saw that, I said, oh, okay, there's no curtailing this. We have to learn what this is. And it really made two perspectives that, that I saw going into the conversation. So, you know, I, I like to throw in this little fun fact before I move into those two paths. Uh, Gannett paused an experiment. This is a, a CNN article about a, a local newspaper that paused an experiment because they were using AI to report the news. <laughs> so it's one of those situations where you go, look, students, this thing that I'm telling you not to use, this reputable newspaper got caught using it and it, it used it improperly. So it was very obvious that the AI made mistakes and they still published it. So this is the conversation that we're in as far as plagiarism and usage of the technology. It's being misused, absolutely. Now, can we properly teach them how to use it is where, is where I like to sit. So this is the, the, the point of view, the two set of point of view that I think has emerged when we talk about the rise of AI in education. And one of those points of view is, is the one that I like. It's that we now have the potential for AI writing, this new consideration to take into account about what is writing? What does it mean to write really? And what are the potentials of writing, of composing, of constructing ideas on the page or how, how we bring these ideas to the forefront, to audiences, right? Um, what does it mean to write? Who is doing the writing? Uh, just before AI, I was reading a very cool book by uh, Lisa Ede uh, that was called Writing Together. And it was about how awesome it was to sit down and write with a colleague and compose together. <laughs> now I, I started looking at AI as a co-composer, right? How can you co-compose with people to see what you're able to do? And once I understood its limitations, I realized, ah, this is what you're able to do. This is what you're not able to do. This is what I could use you for. This is what I could not use you for. And so the potentials, right, something to consider. New writing techniques that have emerged right? as writers, we always have to consider the ways new writing technologies are transforming our learning, our thinking, our, our, the way that we interact with each other. This goes back to writing itself as an early technology, right? We can go back to Plato's disdain for the written form, 
right? We can go back to early 2000, what, 2004, we get that article and is Google making us stupid? Well, yes, it was in a certain way, right? But, but here we are again in this conversation of what is AI gonna take from us? Well, maybe it can give us something if we see it a certain way. So new writing techniques emerge. And how do we talk about writing now that writing that AI is here? Uh, new writing styles and genres. I mean, I can't tell you how much fun I had the week that this thing came out, writing a fun uh, back, back and forth little short story with a colleague on a croissant. So it was a dramatic narrative about a croissant, but it was told first from the perspective of the shop owner so the baker who sold the croissant. And then immediately we told ChatGPT, now tell it from the perspective of the buyer. And it did. And then we said, tell it from the perspective of the croissant. <laughs> and it did a fantastic job of telling the story from the perspective of the croissant. Then I told it, turn that story into a, a, a three-part tragedy. <laughs> and it gave me a script for a tragedy. And then I said, I need two more parts, please. I would like a five part tragedy. And it expanded upon that and it gave me a five part tragedy. Now, afterwards, after this, this process, I saw that one of the campuses, our sister schools at Mesa College did something similar, except they then took it to their, to their drama students and said, perform this. And they turned it into a presentation, an actual AI presentation. I think it's still going on right now, but my point is, Right, you take this new technology and you see what you can do with it or what it can do. And this is the potential side, the, the potential that sees that we must adapt in some way. Now, let me tell you about the other side and then maybe we'll take a quick pause because I see a lot of chat. And so maybe there's something there uh, that we would like to, to discuss. But uh, here is the other side, which is actually, sorry, one more bit on the, the this side. Right. You had new literacies like prompting emerge. So this was the big thing that, that came out was like, what is prompting and what does it mean to prompt? So here you have an article of, a, of an individual making $335,000 as a librarian prompting AI to do the things that we are trying to do now with AI. So new careers that emerge, new developments that happen in professional spaces new opportunities that turn out to be old opportunities, but now more widely cast because more of us are in the conversation of AI. Now, down at the bottom there, there is a link here as well to learn to prompt with AI. If you go to this website, I mean, it basically runs you through the entire prompt engineer situation. Learn how to prompt anything in any way. So it's a resource that I've supplied here in the presentation, you you should definitely use it. It is not my own. I've, I found it in the public domain, but I've definitely given it a, a look over. I've seen what's there. Uh, it tells you about image prompting. It tells you about advanced applications, intermediate, basic. It's got a full suite. And it's just people trying out this technology and seeing what they can do with it. So it's there for your for your later enjoyment. But this is this is the side then that saw prompting as a possibility of something to be useful to students, even in making money while they pay their way through school, which is something that we definitely have to talk about in this landscape where, I mean, school is expensive and housing is ridiculously expensive. And there's a lot of cost saving that we've tried to look at in other, lo in other domains. So maybe there's something here too, right? How can we use this to our advantage is the, the side, the, the, I guess the, the perspective of this side of the conversation. Now, the other side of the conversation this one and it comes with this very beautiful uh, AI Pinocchio. <laughs> right? So uh, I found that uh, in, in another presentation that I've seen as I've scanned materials and I thought it was a beautiful rendition, right? It's got Jasper in the back. And if you know what Jasper is, then I don't need to say more. But if you don't know what Jasper is, Jasper is a commercial AI bot that is being used in commercial spaces. Uh, a, a one one clear cut example is uh, my my friend works for a, a a company a production company and he recently sort of playfully in the background was like hey look they just sent me this link to what to Jasper AI because it's going to be used now in the background for these major corporations to produce their content their copy their email etc so this is the world that we're actually in. Right. The, the, I'm, I'm trying to very much to ground us and where are we actually in this conversation? Now, this is also where we are, right? Did AI write the sentence? And the policing of AI usage, like with uh, GPT-0, 
which was something that came out like a week after ChatGPT came out. It was made by a student um, who decided, you know, if there is a technology for creating AI, there certainly must be a technology for catching the AI creators. It's not a very good tool, not to not to you know sort of trash on this on this tool, but they themselves, the creators, will tell you that it's not very accurate. Beyond that, we now have situations where you you understand that there is plagiarism checkers and AI checkers. So guess what the AI developers are making? Well, AI writers that circumvent AI checkers, right? So you develop it to go around the thing that it's checking for. Uh, in any case. I never liked that approach in general because it's punitive and it focuses on the wrong thing. And if we're teaching AI the right way, which is where we're going to go at in a minute, then I think there's possibility there. And these tools will emerge and they will be there and they will be developed for those of you that want to use them. I mean, Turnitin.com has already integrated this this turn it, this ChatGPT checker. Uh, some of you have tried it. Some of my colleagues have tried it. The results are not great from our sort of single you know, uh, examples. So maybe we need a whole collective body of these results to see if it is accurate across. Uh, but it's, it's it, we'll, we'll go into some of the, the detriments in a minute, but I definitely wanted to, to pause there and see if there's any questions to address. And if not, I can keep keep on rolling. Uh, this is, uh, uh, Oligo, this is just excellent start. And 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 I tell you this question of, of plagiarism and, and, you know, what are we doing now kind of a thing? It just keeps coming back, right? And, and the issue here is that, again, we we are still in this mindset of us versus them or, you know, I will learn from you. But when it comes to chat GPT, I treat it more like a Google. Right. So I ask a question, whatever it gives me, I'm done. Uh, 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 uh. You can have an ongoing intelligent conversation with the entity. Right. And I think that's that's the part that's kind of like missing here that that we are still getting used to maybe 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 that way. So if you could please just just for a sentence or two elaborate on this uh, aspect of of uh, the fact that we can actually ask you know ChatGPT to write something that that cannot be detected by other you you know AI instruments. I I can ask it to write it in my style, right? I mean I can submit my paper to ChatGPT saying okay. Take a look at this. This is my writing style from three years ago. I want this text now to be written like me. Please do yes. it. And yes. it's going to happen. So your comments on this. Uh, definitely. Uh, I do touch on that later in the presentation oh. on the chat on the chat box. No, but but we can definitely uh, briefly just say that this, I, I believe, could be a positive outcome, could lead to positive outcomes, but it could it could certainly be used uh, for ill purposes, right? So it could certainly be misused. But uh, the potential uh, for creating a chatbot that sounds like you, that thinks like you, that assesses content like you, is the is the promise of these chatbots that can re regurgitate the process without being tired, without falling victim to some of their own subjectivity or to their own humanness but we'll get to that as well right so i think i think it's a great point we definitely can train these things to do what we want them to do and the beauty about the training is that they are limited to what you show them this is also the the downfall of ai right when we talk about algorithms and there was a, a, a beautiful book by sophia noble a few years ago on algorithms of oppression and how algorithms themselves could be problematic. And it was because of what you're showing the AI, right? If all you're showing the AI is a certain population group or a certain sample size, well, that's all it can see. So of course you need to put in more, right? Larger data sets. So in this, at this moment, I guess we could have a Jarek and a Rodrigo and an Enrique and a Zola and a Patricia AI versions that are all feeding into a single, let's say bot. And then we're using that bot to assess, to discuss only from these perspectives. So it would be a smaller language learning model. Uh, and that really is the big new thing, by the way. Okay, so at the ASG summit, one of the things that they that they talked about was the cost of running these, these searches. And it's about four cents for every search. It's very expensive. So now they're looking into producing their own chips. So ChatGPT will start producing hardware. Now, again, opportunities for new, um, I mean, careers even for students who are interested in cybersecurity and 
production, manufacturing, et cetera. And yeah, we get into conversations about robotics and what those will do to those jobs, but this is the reality that we're in. So we should have those conversations is sort of where I'm situated. So let, let me continue, but I will get to that point in more detail uh, if that was the, the, key, the key concern there for sure. But let me just jump right into the problem with the plagiarism view. These are our new AI powered tools. Grammarly, which students are constantly using because at once at one point it wasn't AI powered, but now is. Pro writing aid, which sounds exactly like what it is, and a writing aid, but it's been around for a while. You know, you've got Google Docs. Google Docs. Yep, Google Docs and Microsoft Word. So how do you escape now the AI situation when a student can click the little the three little stars? in their Google Doc and have it create AI writing for them. How do you escape that? Do you do you ban Google Docs and Microsoft Word from the classroom? Do we return to pen and paper? We, we certainly could, right? But maybe we transform what we're looking for instead. Maybe we assess for something different instead, a higher order thinking that's still possible through these tools and using these AI powered tools, but maybe it's not the direct composition anymore. Maybe now it's something else. Now, I don't have an answer for what that is directly, but I do have possibilities and suggestions and you know creative approaches. And that's all that anybody has right now. So let's, let's continue here with some of the promises of AI in education, they include improved learning outcomes. I mean, is that, raise your hand if that is a desirable outcome, right? Like, yeah, please, uh, increased efficiency. I, I certainly would love to be more efficient. Real-time insights, which will lead to real-time efficiency, but increased efficiency because, you know, I teach six, well, five to six classes every semester, 25 students a pop, each one submitting essays that are five to six pages, that's a lot of pages, <laughs> that's a lot of pages. Now you have rubrics and templates. How would this be different than a rubric is an excellent question. Because if you've primed the bot to see something that becomes the rubric, that becomes the template that it will assess against. So I think every single one of you in the room has a template. Every single one of you in the room has a rubric. I mean, I, I, I would I would take that bet <laughs> you know, so that someone would raise their hand and say, I have no rubrics. <laughs> and hey, I, I would applaud you for your creative approach to the classroom. But I, I think we all have rubrics and we all have templates. And so if we fall back on those as, as an automated version of what we've already done with our templates and our rubrics, then maybe we can find some middle ground here that isn't polemical. But how can it help with time constraints? Well, grading requires significant time investment, especially for educators with large classes. So sometimes we find ourselves fighting for like smaller classes, smaller classes, smaller classes, right? Now, why would that be? It's certainly not because we don't love teaching large bodies of students. I would teach 100 to 200 student classes if it wasn't because I had to assess that many essays, like that, that consistently, right? Three papers a semester plus supplemental writing. It, it, it's a little bit different for those of you in other disciplines, but I'm thinking through my discipline going, listen, we get the writing in loads. So how do we deal with this? How could we deal with this? Now, what about pressure and stress? I mean, that leads right, right into that point, right? How many of you are overstressed, overworked? You're feeling quite overworked. You know, here we are on a Friday trying to learn some more, right? But hey, we're all overworked. Absolutely. What if these tools could help us facilitate or streamline some of our processes to reduce pressure, make us all happier? And then guess what? You walk into the classroom with more energy. You're working with your students with a better positive attitude even. You're not rushing back and forth to grade papers or to, you know, et cetera. Now, what about subjectivity? We get into the, the issue of, you know, again, how many papers are you grading? How exhausted are you going to get? Are you going to grade the very first one the same way that you graded the 155th paper? I don't know. I don't know. And those are questions that, you know, we get into the, the politics and the polemical issues of grading. But again, I'm trying to be absolutely real with every single one of you. Like these are real questions that you have to ask yourself. So what if we could be consistent, but we keep the rigor and quality up, right? What if I'm offering scenarios, <laughs> no guarantees, because you'll see the tools are lacking, but they promise a lot. 
How about holistic assessment, right? Sorely relying on traditional testing methods, we've already been down that road. We've changed how we assess. We've got multimodal assessment. We've got uh, different approaches to creative assignments, all you know, project-based learning, uh, learn by doing, uh, flip the class, all of these different things that we've done to try to increase our engagement, increase our, our ability to assess student thinking. This is just another one of those. And it, it might promise to synthesize some of the other ones, but we'll, we'll get to those possibilities in a minute when we go over some real examples. So here, here we're sort of leaning towards the real world examples. Uh, adaptive content and assignments are possible if you create AI powered assignments. So imagine uh, that AI systems can analyze students' learning history, their strengths, their weaknesses, their preferences. And based on this analysis, you can adjust the content for each one of your students. I know that I've tried to do that already in my classroom as I've you know, asked them what their interests are and tried to see how I can cater to those interests with the subjects and topics of my class. You know, with, with the writing and the composing that they will do within the workplace or in real professional settings or in real social settings, et cetera. So that would be great to know what do you actually need from this class and how can I adjust the material for your particular learning? Now, that is a time consuming process if you're doing it one on one. But if you're automating it to the machine who will gather that data for you, I mean, then you then you understand the exact composition that's inside your classroom. What student? What are they? What are they strong at? What are they weaker at? What do they like? What don't they like? Where will you lose them? Where will you bring them into the classroom if you're talking about certain subjects or approaching them in certain ways, etc. These are insights that this that this thing promises. Instant feedback is also another major thing. Again, do you have to take those quizzes home to grade them and assess them and do that whole? Yeah, of course. So what if you had an AI version of you that has already gone through the assessments, has already been fed many examples of good responses and bad responses or in underdeveloped responses, and it can spit out the feedback that the student needs. So then you can sit with them and talk about that feedback. It doesn't replace you. In my mind, it never replaces you. It simply gives you a tool to then talk to the student more holistically, more specifically. Hey, here's where your issues were. One, one clear cut example of this, I do show down below, but let me just share the, the story. Right, I had a student who uh, is, is an L2 learner, is, is, uh, English is their second language. The story that they wrote was strong, very strong. The grammar was very, very underdeveloped, right? They need a lot of work with grammar. So I ran the paper through ChatGPT. I told it, only correct the grammar, please. So it did that. Then I gave that student the version of that paper. I said, look at the differences in verb tenses and consider the, the, the syntax of the sentence, right? How would you adjust yours to meet this new one? So that was a, a sentence level exercise developed on the spot. But here's where the magic of AI happens. Then I told it, highlight each of the grammatical errors for me and create a correction for each one with a description for the student about how to correct this same grammatical error in the future. And it just spat out every single grammatical error. It corrected every single one. It gave a whole lesson on how to correct that particular little error. It wasn't a super lengthy, I didn't want to overwhelm the student, but I said, look, here's a few examples. Go consider those and come back and talk to me. And they did, they revised their paper. It was much better the second time around because they worked on those very items. But this is just one example of how long would it have taken me to find every grammatical error, correct every grammatical error. I could certainly do it. I promise you that. <laughs> but, but the time consuming factor there was like, wow. But how, what, again, now I have this ability. Now I can do that. Now I can run it through that way and show them, hey, hey you can do this. So my next step was to show them how to do it themselves. Hey, when you have a paper, that you are happy with, but there are grammar issues still there. Run it through ChatGPT with this prompt and see what comes out. Copy paste the input output, submit your work. Revise as appropriate, of course, submit your work. Now, that, that, that sounds polemical. I know that might sound like, wait, 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 they're submitting work that's not, they didn't write it. See, I'm not suggesting that the copy paste is what they issued. Like Jarek said at the beginning, right? You 
work with it, you talk with it, you develop something good, you make it sound like you want, you mold the clay into the thing that you want it to be, and then you output. But here's the thing, at no point am I considering AI written work, student written work. See, what the AI produces is what the AI produces. And you'll see in a minute that my AI policy in the classroom asks students to be very specific about what did you ask for, what did it give you, and what did you submit? Now, what it gave you should certainly not be what you submit. And so we have these conversations about what it means now to compose in the age of AI, which looks a little bit different than it, than it has before, but certainly no different than a student coming to my office hours to talk with me directly about outlining a paper or to talk with me directly about, hey, how do I do it, a, a solid introduction for this? Or how do I develop my thesis? Or how do I really extract the key ideas here? So if I can create an AI version of myself that students can have access to all the time and then come into my classroom much more confident, I think that's wonderful. But again, I, I acknowledge that it could be ill-used. So let's, let's continue down the path here. Uh, incorporating AI then becomes a, a possibility. And there are new documents coming out constantly. Like here's another link for your later consumption. Uh, an entire book on teaching with generative technology. Now, you're not going to find drastically new approaches here because it turns out what people are trying to do is, is, is fairly simple. Discover what this thing can do and how can I use it? So a lot of the assignments that are in this text gen ed book are, I went to my class, I had them look at AI related, here's my summary. Or I went to my class, I developed an assignment where students use chat GPT for something and then they reflected on it. Or, you know, I went to my, it's very basic assignments. There's nothing here that's like, whoa, you're gonna completely replace an educator in the classroom. Like, no, it's very basic, very simple things that it can do. But the promises of streamlining our, our processes are still there. So. I think we're in a good place if we're learning the discourse of AI, this new literacy that's here upon us. And it really becomes more a question about what can we relegate? So here is a quote from this book, and I think it'll give you a perspective on what's in it. So we need to be mindful of our investment in writing as we try to determine which parts of the writing process we might yield to AI. But certain processes are, are willing to be yielded by these educators who are trying out the technology and saying, well, maybe I give up this, but I gain all of this. And so possibly there's a trade-off. Now, and to what extent we have a choice in the matter as well, <laughs> right? So then we go back to those AI powered tools that will circumvent even our censorship of them. Which parts of the writing process can we cede to AI while retaining what we value about writing? We will soon learn if it is tenable to allow students to use AI for some parts of the writing process. What about brainstorming? What about grammar and style? I've certainly used it for both of those to large success without students submitting work that was plagiarized. So what if we use them for those things? How many of your students that are writing for your classes couldn't benefit from a, a pocket tutor? Right, they can proofread their paper to see if they missed any commas, right? And it's in their pocket, like a calculator. But th this is this has to be taught, right? It's not like it's already there developed for you. The way that our, our technologies currently are, you have to know how to prompt it for it to do what you want. But if you know how to prompt it, you can get that type of feedback. So it becomes that type of situation where if you know how to use it, you have superpowers. If you don't know how to use it, you don't. Now, are we trying to develop superpowered students? I certainly am. <laughs> you know, I certainly am. And when they and when they hit classes beyond mine, I want them to breeze through everything and and shine. Now, again, that doesn't mean they're submitting plagiarized work. No, it means that I've taught them how to use AI properly to circumvent some of those issues and definitely not submit plagiarized work, but their actual thoughts that they now see value in expressing because they didn't relegate their thinking to the machine, they simply used it to structure, to think, to outline, to expand their views. So what we may want to embed uh, constraints in our assignments, absolutely. So as not to offload too much to students' cognitive work to AI, yeah, 
the rigor and the thinking should not be relegated to the machine. Not at all. Creativity should be the focus now, which is higher order thinking. Now, the open question is whether or not these constraints will be possible. As AI language models are increasingly integrated into standard writing workflows, whether students, employers, or readers and writers will care about the human or AI origin of prose. Now, what do you do when your students are using Jasper AI to produce other content as marketers for their professional life? And then they enter your classroom and you tell them, no AI at all, right? No AI at all. They're gonna question you. Well, wait a minute, I'm using it in a professional place over here. I'm getting paid to use AI over here. You're telling me I can't use it to do the same thing over here? And listen, it gets even more polemical when you have teachers like me using AI to present, to create pedagogy, to develop assignments. And now you have the student who says, wait a minute, my teacher's using AI in the classroom. How come I can't use it in the classroom, you know? And so it becomes a very polemical conversation, but it doesn't need to be in a negative sense. It, it is more about an approach we take. So here's where I get excited about this. Some specific examples of, of benefits to AI or with AI. So Georgia State University had these Panther retention grants. Their outcome was that they increased graduation rates by 5%. Now, how so? There's a breakdown here for you. Again, I can't go through every detail of the presentation, but if you click on that link, it shows you the summary of the challenge, what AI did in that role, what were the grants and what were the outcomes. But long story short, they used AI to predict which students would have some financial distress in the near future based on their history, who they are, their economic status, et cetera. And then they gave out grants ahead of time to those students who would face those issues. The result, 5% graduation rate increase. Is that a good application of AI or not? Hey, I leave that to your consideration. But from where I'm standing, I'm going, damn, 5% and they helped people not face financial crisis because they predicted some issue they would face? Wow, I wish we could do that for our students. Why aren't we having that conversation? Now, let's go to Arizona State University, where we had a pilot uh, where they ran, you know, um, they ran this pilot. Again, you can click on the details here if you want more details than what I'm giving here. But point being, coursework was competed, uh, completed 20% faster, not by all students, but by some. Now we get into the conversation about what about those students that are ready to just breeze through your content because they are prepared. Should you hinder them? I mean, we, we can have that conversation as well, right? <laughs> now, let's go down to the University of Michigan. Automated essay scoring, the big polemical, ooh, right? Wait, is grading going to somehow be relegated to the machines? Well, it's not perfect, but this AI tool did some reliable, valid scores compared to human grading. But see, I'm not surprised by that when I understand how we prime responses, even as educators who are assessing students in our classroom. You know, I've sat down with at Miramar and we've primed our, our responses. We've seen, is this a one, a two, a three, a four? Great, let's talk about how we primed this entire set of student responses. And now when we assess them, we are all, wait, it's like we trained ourselves, we prompted ourselves to do this work. Well, AI can do that Can do that too. That's how you can use it. So it's not a perfect example. And the tools are definitely not there for commercial application. Like it's not like you can just go pay a software that will grade papers for you. So we find ourselves in a situation where we have to work with the tools as they are. So learning how to do this with AI has been something that I've been working on myself. How can I streamline assessment? How can I have it grade for me? I'll tell you, disappointingly, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It takes much longer to gain consistency if you're using ChatGPT. Never mind Bard or none of the other ones. They're less consistent. But even ChatGPT, right? You prime it, it gives you a few responses that are consistent, and then it starts trailing off and doing something else entirely. And you have to remind it, hey, wait a minute, what you're, what you're doing now is not what I asked you. And so there is this ongoing uh, situation, this ongoing conversation that really happens when you engage with AI uh, and you determine what it can do and its constraints. And I, I spent like two hours trying to really get my assessment to where it was through the machine, right? I graded the paper myself. 
I ran it through the machine a few times to see what do I have to do to get you to say what I said to assess it how I assessed it. It took hours and the result was not great. <laughs> so, you know, if anybody's got greater tools, please send them my way. I, I'm eager to try them. Uh, but in any case, let's go down to more successful applications of AI. This is where we were talking about the chatbots that Jared, uh, Jared, you brought up. How can you train these? Well, chatbots can allow educators to provide round the clock support for students. Now, I did say can help educators, right? Not replace us, not speak for us, not teach for us. Harvard is doing their first AI taught, completely AI taught class fairly soon. Not that, rather support while we are sleeping, when students are sometimes awake and logging into Canvas at strange hours. But hey, they have their own schedules. So why not have a tool for them there that can support them if they're there? It's like putting up your information on a module in Canvas and it's just there offering support. Now, virtual classrooms are another one, right? So if you uh, email me down below, uh, at the bottom of my email, you'll find a link to muse.play slash the syllabus. It's an immersive web space. Uh, it's a virtual world. Now, how can we use these AI chatbots eventually to immerse students into these virtual worlds and have them engage with maybe AI versions of ourselves? At that point, they'd be using new tools and emerging technologies while addressing old concerns of composition and writing and the same creative and critical thinking that we've had them do or want them to work on. Smart content personalization, we've already gone over a little bit. So the idea that you could cater adjustments to students, right? Specific students who maybe want more. What about those honor students in your class that sometimes want additional rigor? They want higher, uh, you know, higher cha more challenges, right? In the classroom, they want to work harder, great. We, some of us are already doing this differentiated curriculum for some of our students in the class via honors contracts. So I just imagine that this could be a streamlined version of that. Hey, tell me a few things about yourself, a few things about your interests. Let's personalize this lesson plan for you. And remote learning opportunities as well. I mean, now I'm just thinking about creating an AI version of myself that looks like me. Uh, I was showing Patty, actually, I think she'll show a vouch uh, for my Aristotle I, uh, I teach rhetoric in my classes all the time. So I decided to make an Aristotle uh, and to have him speak my lesson plan for me. And so at the beginning of my rhetoric uh, you know, uh, module, I'm placing him there now. Students will press play and he will tell them about the, the three main reasons why they need to understand rhetoric. And it's my lesson plan. I simply took my lesson and I, I created a soliloquy on rhetoric in the style of Hamlet that Aristotle speaks, <laughs> right? So it's a very, very fun activity and students have enjoyed just asking like, what is this? How did you make this? And how can I make this? And then I think that's the right question, right? How can I make this? Yes, let's talk about that. So remote learning then would be empowered by this AI bot of myself that would be there just hanging out in a virtual space supporting students. All possibilities, not fully here yet, but possibilities. Does it sound intriguing to you is my question. Now, another, um, sorry, well, let me go back. Actually, I have another example here. Um, AI-based grading assessment and tools now include things like turnitin.com, which we've talked about. So it can detect uh, Edmodo is a good example of an AI-powered tool. So some of you have used Edmodo. You're like, wait, now Edmodo has AI? Yes. <laughs> so uh, they, they've applied now, they've plugged in the AI, let's say, to make the tool better in some way. At least it was their, their view that it would be better. And then finally, Quizlet, which I tried the other day, so I had a little asterisk, and uh, it was pretty good. It made some quizzes. Uh, it takes your content and turns it into learning aids. Is that useful application of AI for your classroom? I certainly am thinking of more ways to use it. Like, wait, I want to get, have my students practice these ideas? What if I had Quizlet just create materials for me that I don't have the time to make because going into Canva just takes forever. Wait, Canva just integrated AI too. So we don't have to worry about that problem. <laughs> right? So there's all of these new things that are developing is my point. So what does that mean? Um, we can try to experiment. Uh, it means that these are some of my experiments. I want to show you directly what I've done. So this is one of the prompts that I created. And you can take this and copy paste it right in the chat GPT if you want to. That's how I have, that's how I've used it. So 
uh, use the following criteria to evaluate student writing and to provide feedback for improvement. Here are the key criteria. So these are the things that I, again, actively look for in my rubric. So did they provide an adequate summary of the story in question? Did they extract keywords and phrases with some direct quotes? Did, are, they, are they assessing the author's ideas, noting limitations as well as where they agree, right? Should they be show, are they showcasing an example of their own as I've said that they should? And double check the grammar for me to see if there's any issues, right? So literally copy, paste, that first, and that primes the bot to respond to you. Then submit the student writing, copy paste. And it'll give you some feedback. Now, again, it's not perfect feedback. Uh, I've done a few of these post grading the actual student writing, again, to see how accurate is it to what I would actually say to the student, because that's where we are right now, as far as I understand it. I'm definitely eager to hear from the other presenters and see where, where sort of they've taken this conversation, but it's we're in experiment mode. So let's try this out and see, oh, look, it's not actually accurate. Oh, look, it's actually flawed in this way. Oh, look, can help me with this, but not with this, and determine how best to use it. So may, maybe now it's about teaching AI literacy instead of policing AI usage. Now, what that would look like could be something like this. So here's an example of, uh, again, another back and forth activity. Here's me telling it, I've completed my draft. Please proofread it for any errors or in grammar or tense. Refrain from rewriting or changing what I have written unless to correct the errors. Now see that, that little tag at the end, refrain from rewriting is a powerful tool to use when you're working with AI. But see, you would only know to use that if you've been using AI and you're like, stop rewriting AI. <laughs> I don't want you to rewrite this. I want you to look for grammar errors. I want, so it's prompting it and priming it to do exactly what you want. Now here's the, here was the output by the way. So this was the text. And if you look at it, evolute, uh, right? Power T, it just has a lot of grammatical errors. So what it gave me back was the corrected version. There it is. Analyze and evaluate. Perfect. Poetry. It just corrected all those grammatical mistakes. And then I said, you know, I want people to visualize this. So please bolden all of the errors for me so that I can see them. There they are. So again, how, how powerful is this for your usage? Maybe you're not going to use this for every single assignment. That would be very time consuming. But what if it's a shorter writing task where you do want to teach a grammatical lesson? Or what if it's a, an assignment that is filled with grammatical errors and you want to show the student how to correct them? You could certainly sit with them, correct every single one of them, and that might be ideal. But here AI is giving us a way of doing some version of that without taking away from the students, without taking away from the educator, without taking away from the learning situation that's happening. So those are minor ways that, I, that I, it's been used, uh, that I've used it, I should say. Some of the issues that come about when you're talking about AI in the classroom are accuracy. A lot of things wrong. So don't trust it. It's biased. We've already been down that conversation road. So give it a larger sample size. Show it what you want it to see. Data privacy. Well, that's something we need to be talking about in general. So it doesn't only belong to this conversation, but certainly is a part of it. What about equity and accessibility? Are we creating a new literacy gap? by preventing students from using AI effectively? That is my question, and I use it in that very direct way because I think about it in that way. Wait a minute, hold on. This is a powerful tool that we're now creating this gap for students to know how to use it. It would be equivalent to the educator using AI and the educator not using AI in my perspective. And again, can we do the things that we were taught to do, trained to do? Of course, but can we do them in a more streamlined way with AI. I think that's the conversation to have. So we need more training and integration. So I'm glad we're here talking about this, but up until a few months back, there was very few conversations happening. And now we've got the ball rolling. We're all here interested in it and that's fantastic. So where do we go now? You know, we need to talk about addressing the concerns of plagiarism, ethical considerations. How do we work against that? What can we do? Uh, I think, Instead of policing for it, I think we teach them how to use it. And we're very specific about how we have them use it. 
and we have them report exactly how they used it. And then you don't have plagiarism at all. You know, if I tell you that to use any AI in the classroom is cheating, well, that's very different than if I say you may use it to brainstorm an outline, but definitely don't use it to draft. And then you submit an AI generated draft. And what am I going to say? Well, that's plagiarism. You're cheating. That's how I told you not to use it. I said outline and brainstorm and you produce actual writing with it. See, that's not what it was for. But they would know that up front is my point. They would know how I expect them to use it. It would be a very different conversation than, than a classroom where they're like, can I use it? Should I use it? I don't know if the teacher even knows about it. So my students know that I know about it. And it's in a policy. So we'll get to that in a moment. But responsible usage then is, is essential. Um, we need diverse representation. Again, going at the bias. So what we feed it is what it can see. And human-centered. Very much like my colleagues who do the online, uh, humanize online. Absolutely. Can we humanize AI? I know that sounds contradictory. <laughs> but maybe we can. Let's humanize how we use it. Now, Tools and resources here, just to conclude, because I, I do see I'm close to the hour. Uh, tools and resources really go at that MLA CCC document that I told you about. So if you haven't seen it, there is another link to it here. It's a PDF. Uh, and I pulled out what was considered to be one of the main risks. Uh, students, teachers, and profession are, um, sorry, the spread of misinformation, the biased outputs, the privacy and copyright violations, and the environmental costs all of which I think we've talked about at some point in this presentation. Now, all of these concerns affect our students and should inform our responses as educators. We will focus here on potential risks to students, teachers, and the program and profession itself. So again, I, I extracted what are the main concerns. And let's just read one or two of them so you understand what they are. Students may miss writing, reading, and thinking practice because they submit generative AI outputs. Absolutely, except we've already talked about the fact that I don't have them use it that way. I specifically tell them not to have it generate writing for them, but use it to brainstorm, use it to outline, that's fine. Students may not see writing or language study as valuable since machines can mimic these skills. Certainly, if they don't understand the limitations of the machine, if they don't understand that the prompting skill required to prompt it well is a part of learning syntax and grammar and literacy. You have to do it with your statements, your sentences, your organized thoughts. That's how you prompt it. Now, there will be no coding options coming pretty soon. I'm sure check a box and it does what you want. But if those tools are coming, then let's teach them how to use it the, re the original way, through the prompting, not these things that are built on top. Now, risk to teachers. You know, teachers may be asked to make significant changes to their practice without adequate time, training, or comp uh, compensation for their labor. Again, here we are on a Friday learning about AI and, and then really talking about it long form, but we're not being compensated all the time. We are stressed out. We have papers to grade. I've got a stack of three classes waiting for me after I hop off this presentation. <laughs> you know, so it, it's one of those things where could we use it to streamline would be a better uh, a better uh, point of discussion. What about the, pro the profession itself? It talks about how it will be diminished as a discipline for X, Y, or Z reasons. I will have you look at those reasons. The only reason I'm breezing through is because when you get to my syllabus policy, it addresses 90% of the concerns in that document. So what does my syllabus policy look like? This is what I have in my syllabus and I tell my students, this is how you're gonna use AI. Artificial intelligence is one of the emerging Web3 tools that promises to shake up both the academic and professional landscape. Regardless of how you feel about it, learning to use it well is an emerging and valuable skill. That being said, you can expect to use AI in my classes, ChatGPT and MidJourney AI at a minimum. Please be aware of these three things. Number one, if you provide weak props, you will get weak results. You will need to refine your prompts in order to provide good outcomes, better outcomes. This will take work. It's not an easy thing. Number two, don't trust it at all. <laughs> don't trust anything it says to you. Assume facts that it gives you are wrong unless you know the answer or you can check it with another source. Any mistakes that it, it does provide, you're responsible for. 
you need to fact check yourself. You need to fact check ChatGPT for sure. Now, finally, any AI use must be acknowledged. Please be sure to include a paragraph of any assignment that uses AI explaining how you used it, what you used it for, what specific prompt you put in, so what was your input, and what was the output. Here's what I said, here's what it said. Failure to do so is in violation of academic honesty policies because we've already talked about what plagiarism is. And I've already told them not to submit work that is AI generated. So they can think through the AI, they can brainstorm through the AI, they can organize through the AI, but if, they're, if it's writing for them or thinking for them, that's the wrong application and it's right there in the syllabus. And they sign a contract at the beginning of the class saying that they acknowledge and understand this. So I'm not really policing them after this point because they know not to use it that way. I'm also familiar enough with the way that it sounds that when I have run into students who are plagiarizing, it's inevitable that some will try, I can recognize when it's AI generated. It's, it's, it's uh, the same way that you would recognize if a paper is in a five paragraph format if, you, if you've been teaching composition for a long time. Like you know what that looks like if you, <laughs> yep, done. <laughs> I know what this is, I know this construction, right? So it's just experimenting with it. So long story short, there's other tools here provided as well. Um, I have provided a um, open AI teaching with AI resource that ChatGPT itself put out. Uh, I have provided here uh, seven approaches for um, working with AI prompts. Uh, this is a larger abstract and the full PDF of a research paper where some educators that I've been talking to on Twitter have just tried different things with AI. Um, very similar to the previous book that was linked there, but I wanted to give as many resources here as possible so you could see where this is all stemming from. Uh, and then finally, uh, here's another resource that I like. Uh, I went to this conference digitally called AI for Education, and they had this chart, which is very simple to understand. It basically says the same thing that my syllabus policy says, right? Are you using it in this way? Great. Are you using it for these reasons? Then no, <laughs> you know, just a visual graphic. Sometimes uh, it helps to show them that. And then finally, Conclusion and takeaways then. So AI is becoming increasingly prevalent in education. AI should be used responsibly and ethically. Um, excuse me, AI uh, is a powerful tool that can provide uh, increased learning outcomes and efficiency. And AI can become a powerful tool for equity, but can become is the key point there. Can become, but won't necessarily become if it's used in a different way. If it's not used as, as I've suggested here, not that again, I am the end all be all of this, but rather the approach of how can we use this rather than should we police its usage. Uh, finally, just to kind of close this out, if you have any interest in writing about this, then I, I am putting out a call for, it's already out, a call for papers uh, for a magazine similar to the one that was there linked, the, the uh, AI in the classroom. So any of you that are writing about AI, uh, please submit. Uh, you know, submit to the uh, call for papers. And when the magazine is published, the beauty about this is that it would definitely go to every California college. Uh, it may go to the other colleges, definitely colleges that are interested in, in it, if you would like a copy of it. But I would love colleges from all around the, the, the country uh, in a global sense to publish in this thing. It's called Inside English, but it's interdisciplinary. Um, and if you are interested in more, uh, I am doing more of these presentations um, I did the first one, which is equivalent sort of to this one uh, a few a few weeks back. Uh, this was a combination, I think uh, I would say of this one here and this one here. It was two and uh, one and three sort of combined is what we just talked about. The next one is actually completely focused on artwork. Uh, it is a art from words. So how, how you can use AI to unleash creativity in education. And uh, the final one is AI and innovation. So entrepreneurship and AI. Um, but in any case, I thank you for your time. Thank you for letting me present. I think I went a, a few minutes over, uh, but thank you. <laughs> Rodrigo, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and your resources. Uh, uh, we thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure you'll be getting a lot of emails from us <laughs> for future presentations. It's not right, Jarek. Yep, that's it. So again, uh, the chat has just been exploding, it, it, you know, as, as as you were speaking, there's just just so many so many interesting topics that you've been raising. So thank you again. I'll I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Ashley and Zola. I, I know they've been waiting there 
impatiently. So without without any further delay, please, uh, Ashley, go 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 and yeah, let's go ahead and get you started. It's eleven oh six. Please. Thank you, thank you, Jarek. Um, I think I'll just wait for Zola to pull up the the presentation. Yeah. I am doing that right now. All right. We have it. Yes. All right. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to today's slowest talk. My name is Ashley Berry. And I am a uh, adjunct faculty over at Cal State Dominguez, and I also teach over at Golden West College. I'm also the CEO and founder of the Higher Ed Institute, which is an organization that um, promotes um, the exchange of ideas and high impact practices between educators. Um, and AI has been the, the focus that um, uh, myself and Zola, uh, us as a dynamic duo, have been working on for a uh, probably a little over a year. So I'll go ahead and let Zola introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am excited to be back here this week. I don't know if you caught me in my presentation last Friday, but I am excited to be here again. So my name is Zola Ponte. I am a higher education instructor. Um, I teach sociology. I'm also an instructional designer and e-learning developer. And I have been, like Ashley mentioned, working with her um, in her new venture, the Higher Ed Institute, as her lead designer and co-presenter, facilitator, and things like that um, for the past year. And we are very excited to be delving into yet another chat about AI and education. So um, before I get started on the, you know, what our student learning outcomes are, I did want to, um, to let you, you guys know that, you know, if you were here last week, you probably saw this is going to be, there's going to be a little bit of overlap of what Zola talked about last week in terms of assessments, just because she did share with me that the chat was literally blowing up when she was doing some of her um, how to uh, how to tutorials. So what we did this week was the ones that we felt were really important, we actually recorded and we created videos for those so that you could go back later and you could use them because I am, I am very much a visual combined with kinesthetic learners. So I have to be doing something while I'm watching it in order for me to really absorb it and get good at it. So if you see a little bit of overlap, that is why. Um, and some of the learning outcomes that we're going to be going over, some of the student or some of our learning outcomes are understanding um, large language models. And I know, you know, Rodrigo did go over some of that. So we'll sort of briefly talk about it. Um, and then understanding formative and summative assessments. Again, this will be really brief because I'm sure as the educators, we're all pretty familiar with this, but I, you know, I don't like to get to Z until I start with A. Um, and then leveraging AI to create formative, formative assessments, summative assessments, and rubrics that align with your student learning outcomes. And then we'll be employing AI for unbiased grading and feedback. And we'll talk about the importance of that, um, especially when we get into rubrics. And then we're going to be utilizing AI to analyze ass assignments, assessments, and rubrics for alignment with SLOWS, especially for those who are like, you know what, I already have a lot of really great assessment tools. I just want to know how I can better align them to my SLOWS. So that way you're not really reinventing the wheel, if you will. Now, um, we're going to ask you guys just because we're curious about our audience, and I always like to know kind of who I'm dealing with. So if you guys could do us a favor and scan the QR code. And tell us um, if you have used any type of artificial intelligence for building assessments or grading assessments, okay? So we'll give you just a minute to do that. Okay. Okay. So, so so far we have we have quite a few respondents who have um we have about fifty percent. So we have seventeen folks who've responded. Um, a lot of people have never used it for either one. Um, we have some who've used it to create assessment only. 
Very few of you have used it to grade an assessment. Okay, so for those of you who actually have used it, could you either just put a one-liner in the chat, just a one-liner and tell us either something that you loved about um, using it as an assessment tool or a piece of advice that you have for folks using it as an assessment tool. Okay, so um, while you guys do that, um, just because, you know, I love like all the interaction between folks. So I always feel like, you know, this is a good way to kind of get started to get the get jumped off into the into the into the conversation to know who's doing it and who's not and what what types of experiences that we've all had with it. Um, one second. OK. Okay, so some folks said they love spending way less activity creating or way less time creating activities. Good for keeping your assessment focus on slows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um some folks. Perfect. Okay, so we'll we'll move on just because we have a lot to get through. Um, but thank you so much for participating. And if you feel like talking about it in the chat, we'll be reading your comments. <laughs> So I think that Rodrigo already did a really great job going over what AI is, and I don't think we really have to discuss it any further. Um, the one thing that I just, he briefly mentioned that, you know, some of these um, chatbots that we've been using are large language models. And so I just want to make sure that those are specifically the ones that we're going to look at today. There's a lot of other ones too. Like, I don't know if you checked out like the actual presentation that Rodrigo was using, which was through Gamma. And Gamma is also a... Um, an AI platform, right? But it's creating presentations instead of like, you know, the chat bots that we're working with. So there's lots of other types of AI too, but for today, we're gonna focus on these uh, large language models. So um, we're gonna look at ChatGPT, which is what I kind of like introduced everybody to last week, but then we're also gonna work a little bit within Claude AI because I like some of the responses that I get from Claude a lot better in some cases versus uh, ChatGPT. And it's just, depending on like how the conversations go and like, you know, the output that you get. And then also the fact that on the free versions, I can kind of upload a document to Claude and I can't really do that with ChatGPT yet. So that would be like the big difference within some of the, the large language models and the different chatbots that you have, like some can look at documents and some cannot. And so since I'm an educator and I'm using this to kind of help, you know, my work become more efficient, right? I really want to make sure that um, I can actually upload these types of things. So we also talked a little bit about like the biases. I saw the chat kind of blowing up about that for a little bit. And so biases, yes, that exists within AI. So we have to be careful about that. So no matter how we're using AI, it's never going to replace us as an educator, right? It's never going to replace our expertise. So please just be aware that this is just um an assistant. It's really just supposed to help you make your life as an educator easier. Um, so some of the AI capabilities then. So Rodrigo talked about what it can and can't do. And these are some of the things that we've found that it can do. So review quality, relevance, and learning outcomes. Analyze questions and content for bias and cultural bias check for accessibility issues, evaluate reading levels, assess difficulty in cognitive levels, generate questions that represent diverse perspectives. And just like Rodrigo was mentioning too, output in is output out, right? So when you have a quality prompt, you will be able to get some of these things and you will get quality output. So if you don't have quality prompts, you will also not have quality output. Okay, Ashley. Okay, so um, Rodrigo also went over some of the benefits. So we're going to kind of rehash that a little bit. So um, I find that when using um, any large language models for grading, um, I get pretty consistent results. Um, I also make sure that I'm doing a lot of training, whether that's like giving them samples of past reflections or papers that have done really well, right? So it knows what I'm looking for. Um, I love that 
um, you know, on days when, you know, I'm in a bad mood or I'm extra stressed out, right? It can help me to kind of keep my grading consistent. So um, there, you know, it kind of helps to take away the bias. And then efficiency. So, um, you know, we, one of the, um, one of the, the educators that I work with, and this goes along with the, um, the reduced workload, she was talking about, you know, once upon a time when she first started teaching, uh, teaching was getting in front of the classroom, reviewing her notes, right? There wasn't PowerPoints or coming with up with engaging uh, activities or talking about culturally relevant pedagogy. She says that now a lot of times that she feels like she has to entertain, right? And so, you know, if we're talking about efficiency, what it's doing is it's taking a task, right? Maybe based on a rubric, right? So we're looking for more or less sort of the same things when we're grading and it's making it a lot easier for you. Um, the other thing is like, you know, scalability. Um, I, I work with, so I don't know, I know that this isn't as common at the community colleges, but at the Cal State level, um, your lecture classes can be up to 120 students, right? And so if you're having students write reflections every single week, this can be a really large load to take on. So it helps with these larger classes that, you know, you might kind of, you, you're looking for like certain responses and certain answers, and it really helps to kind of streamline things for you. And then immediate feedback. Um, I've been in higher, you know, I've worked in higher ed for the last 10 years, and probably the biggest complaint that I got when I was working on the student services side, right, because they're not going to complain about me as a professor to my face, well, usually they don't anyways, is that they would say that their, their teachers would take forever or not at all, they wouldn't be giving them feedback at all, right? And so, of course, we all have really busy lives, um, but kind of the thing that they would tell me is, is like, how am I supposed to improve or do better on my assignment if I'm not receiving quality feedback or, or any feedback at all, right? And so this really helps to bring about kind of like robust feedback um, so that our students are, are learning and kind of gaining the skills that they need to be successful in our classes. Um, and then objectivity, right? So um, we all have our favorites, right? We have the students that sit at the front of the class. They're always raising their hand. They're always answering questions, right? We begin, you know, implicitly to develop biases for student and students. And this is actually true on a larger level too. And I'm going to talk about how um, a lot of times we'll have implicit racial biases as well um, that we don't even notice that we have, right? And so this creates, you know, this gives uh, are these large language models a standard. It tells them what exceeds the standard, what meets the standard, and what needs improvement, and it lets them um, use the, inf or it lets them help you, or allows you to assess um, not based on any of those implicit biases that we're developing. Um, and then this idea of focusing on higher level tasks. So, you know, being able to come up with creative activities and, um, you know, discussion questions and not have to be as focused on grading. Um, and so multilingual support. So this is actually something that, um, that Zola added. So she did a little experiment. I'll let, I'll let her tell you about that. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, I am a, um, I speak two languages. I am from Sweden and I have been in the, in the U.S. since 2007. And um, I just thought it was interesting, you know, like what if I was to ever go back? Could I create these assignments in, in Swedish? So I used um, ChatGPT to basically, like I had already written out my lesson plan, my, my slide information and things like that. And I implemented that in ChatGPT and I asked it, please convert this to Swedish. And it did such a good job like it was just a, a few things here and there that I had to change but even like my assignments I have those translated into Swedish and then I've done the same with um so I have a lot of Hispanic speakers in my courses and so I've been able to also recreate assignments in Spanish for these students to kind of help them look at words that they might not be super familiar with and it's done a really good job obviously I am not actually uh, you know I don't speak Spanish so I also also always have to kind of provide that little 
that little note, right? That I, I'm sorry, like I've, I've had ChatGPT create this assignment in Spanish and it's been translated. So I apologize if there's anything in here that might not seem correct, but um, when it did it in Swedish, it did a really good job. So I could at least see it from, from that language perspective, right? Thanks, Ola. And then the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is the ability for ChatGPT to generate data and insights about students. And we always talk about this idea of like molding the learning experience to individual students. And I think for a long time, we felt like, how do you do that when you have a class of 45 students? Well, this kind of allows us to do that because it's always generating um, you know, really robust data on how our students are, are doing and what they're learning versus what they're not learning, um, what they're struggling with, right? What most of the class is struggling with versus, versus maybe a little bit less. Um, and so this can be a really great tool in terms of molding the learning experience. Next slide. Okay. So um, now we've talked about some of the benefits for you uh, for you as an educator, but then also some of the benefits for the students then. I mean, it really goes hand in hand. And, and like the, the really big thing here that it comes down to is just making sure that we are incorporating unbiased assignments, unbiased quizzes, and then really providing more equitable outcomes, right? And then same within our grading. So um, we have the ability here to then create assessments that better measure true knowledge and skills. We have fairer and more equitable assessments. Um, we have fairer and more equitable grading, just like Ashley mentioned, there's been proof that there is a lot of bias in our um, in our grading. Uh, if we have, you know, favorite students, if we have students that like never show up to class, but all of a sudden they're producing this like exemplary work and we're wondering like, is it their own? You know, we have all of these things going on. So it might always be equitable. So um, utilizing AI to assist you, again, not doing it for you, but assist you in your grading, you might be able to then see some things that you weren't considering otherwise. And then the ability to provide alternative assessment options with the same level of integrity to learning outcomes. So let's say that you have a learner that is really struggling in a particular type of learning, like maybe they are not that great at um, writing papers and your class is not about teaching students how to write papers. It's, you know, sociology, for an example. So how can you create another a, a type of assessment that is still providing these same tools, the same learning outcomes, the same level of integrity, but in a different format. So that's kind of how um, I've also had the ability to kind of use AI to look at, well, let's create three different assignments that students, you know, they, they're doing all of these things, and then they can choose which assignment they want to do based on what type of learner they are. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so, <laughs> I'm 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 gonna guess that most of us know the difference between these two. Um, so you know I'll keep it brief, right? One is is when we're going you know over a chapter in the middle of a unit, right? And this is these are low stakes like reflections, quizzes, concepts, ma concept mapping, and then one is summative, which kind of gives us an, an idea about how much was learned during that unit, right? So exams, research paper, papers, final projects. These are more high stakes. And I just kind of wanted to say that we are planning on talking about both types kind of throughout and interchangeably. Hey, so the first thing that I want to mention is that um, I, so I, I um, mentioned this in my last Friday meeting too, that I participated in a online um, uh uh, conference over the summer and there was a lady that talked about the create model and so I made some adjustments and we will share this with you later but it is essentially a google document that I've created and then um, I've added our create model to it so that you can see a lot more detail in how to actually prompt right so this is how you would um, lay out your prompts to get quality output back Okay, so again, well, uh, at the end of the slide, you will have the actual link to this Google document so that you can access it and you can check it out. Um, but I'm going to do a little bit of show and tell now. So with utilizing the create model, we're going to create an assignment 
Okay, so I am going to pull up, um, sorry, I'm gonna pull up a new, new chat GPT tab here. And then I am going to show you, this is another document that we have and that you'll also have access to. So um, the title of our presentation today. And so these are all of the prompts that I'm going to kind of go over today, right? To help you through some of these um, questions. And so the first thing that we're going to do is, uh, like I said, we're going to create an assignment. But the first thing that I want to do right now is go over and do um, this prompt and just create a lesson plan. So I want to create my lesson plan first and then have the assignment. Okay. But then I also have um, this prompt right here. So maybe you already have your lesson plan and you just want to create an assignment. So this would be a prompt that would be appropriate for creating an assignment without a lesson plan. But I just want to show you how this could look like. So I'm going to take my prompt and I am um, putting in here, I'm going to go back to this page right here. So pretend that you are a sociology professor teaching an introduction to sociology course for adult learners, because most of us are in higher education. So we want to make sure that we are teaching andragogy and not pedagogy, right? I'm using this textbook and this chapter we're covering, or in this week, we're covering chapter eight, social stratification in the United States and globally. So this is similar to what I did last week, but then we're going through the entire create model so all the things that we might need, and then I'm um, asking it to help or help create this lesson plan. So here we have a 70 minute lesson plan on Zoom, because this is what I asked for. And then I'm also asking it to go over Gagne's uh, nine events of instruction, because this is how we, um, this is a great way to basically keep our adult learners engaged. Okay, so Gagne's nine events of instruction. I don't know how many of you have heard it. This, you know, something that we talk about a lot as instructional designers, but this is really to kind of keep help adult learners engaged. So I've put that in here and then it's showing basically these levels, right? So gain attention, um, inform learners of the objective, stimulate recall. So it's showing us exactly what we can do. So then my next prompt here um, would be to, create this assignment. So I'm asking it to look at these, um, the, 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 the idea that this specific lesson plan was um, to go over an in-class assignment. So it shows the assignment brief, the case study, and then it also gives me the, the guiding questions and then grading criteria, things like that. So in my original prompt here, I said, based on your learner participation activity, further develop the in-class assignment so that I may use it within my learners during the Zoom class. So this is actually creating the whole assignment that I can then use within my Zoom class. And then lastly, I also want to, um, or maybe I also want to have an assignment that is for students to complete um, at home. So I can add that to it too. So create an assignment that students will need to complete on their own as homework. And then I'm providing some information about, um, you know, what I want them to do. I'm including, we've all, I already included, by the way, in this original prompt, my SLOs. So my, my student learning outcomes for this particular course are already included. And then, so make sure that the assignment is both culturally relevant and unbiased. So I'm already stating that in here, okay. Uh, develop a grading criteria where the total point of the assignment is 50 points. And then this is just, sorry, this is for additional information. So if you wanted anything else, you could add that here, but I'm not gonna do that for this particular assignment. So now it's creating this, this um, next, uh, assignment for me. And if you want to regenerate it, let's say that you didn't like it, you can go ahead and regenerate it. And then you'll have both, uh, both options. So here you get a different option. So you can choose which one or, you know, take pieces out of it. But then the cool thing here then is that we want a rubric. Okay, so this is how I typically set up my rubric. So I will also need a rubric for this assignment based on your assessment criteria. Please format the rubric into a table. I want students to be graded based on these three categories, excellent, competent, and developing are missing. So then let's go ahead and do that too. 
And now it is creating this rubric for me. And there you go. Okay. So that's how we would do it. And again, you will have access to all of these things. And um, always remember when you are doing these things, you are going to need your personal expertise, your, your subject matter expertise, right? And you're going to need to review everything, make sure that it is exactly how you want it to be. If there's anything that you want to change, you have the conversation with AI. You let them know, hey, you know what? I don't really like this type of assignment. Let's focus on a different subject. Let's focus on a different area. But as you delve into our prompts, um, so once you get the document from me with our prompt you'll see exactly what it is that I'm asking for and it's so important that you are incorporating all of these types of different levels within your prompt because otherwise you're not going to get quality back okay I'm gonna hop back to Ashley and okay. then we're gonna talk more about some of these things in a little bit okay so we wanted to kind of pause on rubrics for a second and talk about why rubrics are so important um, when I first started grading seven years ago, I really didn't use rubrics because in my mind it was like, well, I created the assignment. I know what exceeds the standard, what meets the standard and what needs improvement. But, um, you know, over the years, I found um, that rubrics really help to, you know, provide consistency. Right. Um, and I, I was I'm taking this uh, class through the through the CSU chancellor's office and it talked about we talked about this study that was done at University of Southern California that discussed implicit biases in grading. And it really highlighted the findings of a study where researchers sought to understand implicit racial biases in specifically. And I, and I went ahead, if you guys um, wanna check the article out, it's a really cool article, but it talked about the impact of racial biases in grading. And um, it identified kind of in effective interventions in mitigating it. And so it took, 400 faculty nationally. Um, they were all, you know, instructors and they, they were told to evaluate identical assignments. The only difference with the assignments was is that um, one would have, um, you know, some of them got assignments with stereotypically black names and some got assignments with stereotypically white names. And um, they found that the assignments that had stereotypically black names were on average graded, um, you know, more harshly, right? That they gave far lower, the, like the scores were sig sig statistically significantly lower than those who, who had white names, sorry, that having a word salad in my mouth right now. Um, but what they were able to do is by offering these um, uh, instructors rubrics, that the, the statistical significance, what there was, it was no longer statistically significant, right? And so it showed that, you know, if, you know, if we want to um, get rid of, you know, the, the implicit racial biases that we have towards these students, this is a really great tool to help us do that. Um, it also helps um, encourage learning and understanding, right? Um, so in Canvas, um, if you've ever used like the rubrics link, right, where it, it, it will like break down everything that we're looking for, that is a really great way for, stu for to provide students feedback in every single area of their paper, what we're looking for, what we're, you know, trying to help them avoid, right? And so that they get an idea about how to perform better uh, going forward. So we really wanted to point that out. And I know Zola kind of showed you how she built rubrics, but we did create our, or I created a video that kind of goes step by step. So we wanted to go ahead and share that you how we can create rubrics using artificial intelligence for anti-biased, anti-racist, high-impact pedagogical practices. So stay tuned for this tutorial. Step one to building your rubric in AI is to define your learning outcomes. And at this point, I'm assuming if you have an assessment tool, you already have your learning outcomes. So if it wasn't built in ChatGPT, then you're going to want to let ChatGPT know what it is. The learning outcome I used is assess and analyze how the brain retrieves and processes information from the working memory using recent personal experiences, specifically using Badley's model. 
Now we're going to break that learning outcome down into specific criteria. So was there evidence that they offered using their own personal experiences or um, how did they analyze Badley's model in relation to themselves? For the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to keep our rubric structure really simple. It either exceeds standards, meets standards, or needs improvement. Here you'll notice that I added that uh, key criteria that we talked about. Um, students should provide evidence of their personal experiences and how they parallel with tasks involved in working memory and demonstrate their ability to criti critically analyze how these cognitive tasks are being processed. I also have my rubric structure and then my descriptors, which um, Students should demonstrate a thorough understanding of Badley's model, cite specific information to draw parallels from the textbook to their personal experiences. During this step, you get to translate those descriptors that we just made into point values. And you also get to ask ChatGPT what, what you want your rubric to look like. For my grading key, I've asked uh, ChatGPT to format it into a table, assign five points to each category for a total of 15 points possible. Now that we have our prompt all ready to go, we can go ahead and click on the enter button and see what it generates for us. As I look through uh, the rubric, I do notice that there's already a mistake. The point value doesn't actually add up to 15 points, and that was likely due to an error that I made while creating my prompt. So it's, again, this is a really good reminder to double check everything before putting it into Canvas or publicly posting it for students. That is all for our video tutorial for today. You can find the step-by-step -step on how to build out your rubric on ChatGPT in the comment section below. And you'll also find some extra tips and tricks that I didn't mention in the video. Please make sure to like, follow, and share our YouTube channel, The Higher Ed Institute, or follow me on Instagram at The Relatable Professor. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Okay. So, a couple of things that I didn't talk about in the video, just Ooh, because how we can like, create rubrics using our sorry, <laughs> all good. Uh, so a couple <laughs> <Sorry>. things. <laughs> all good. All right, ready? Okay. So a couple things that I didn't talk about in the video, just because I like to keep those video tutorials uh, pretty short. I just feel like. I have uh, a little bit of ADD when it comes to watching things. So I assume everybody else kind of has a short attention span as well. Um, if you plan to use AI to assist you with grading, you need to train it using the rubric, right? And I know Rodrigo did talk a little bit about this and so did Zola, so I'll keep it brief. But um, one thing that I do is, is that I provide examples. Like, so let's say I, I have students do a reflection. I provide examples of what the really good reflections are that I'm, you know, how, um, you know, what types of things that I'm looking for in these reflection responses, um, and then how I would respond to them if I was grading them all by myself. Um, and then there's this idea of testing and adjusting. So before using ChatGPT for actual grading, you want to test it, you want to test it out, and then, you know, maybe tell it, you know, I, I didn't like, uh, you know, that verbiage that you use, I, I don't normally say that, or I wouldn't have included that, or maybe um, that's a little bit too deep for their understanding. So, um, you know, let's reevaluate Badley's model, right? And then, um, you know, grading student reflections. So you're going to use ChatGPT alongside the rubric to grade the student reflections. Um, I always add in my own, you know, my own input. Like I don't just rely on these large language models because as we've talked about and you'll hear over and over again, um, there's going to be things that don't make sense. And I, I swear it's it's the funniest thing when whenever um, you tell ChatGPT that it didn't do something wrong, it'll be like, oh, my bad. This That was my oversight, right? And so it, it, it'll catch it right away. Like, okay, I didn't know that you wanted it that way or, you know, next time I'll do better. Right. Um, but just know that, you know, just because it sounds really confident, it might not be exactly what you're looking for. Um, and then want to continue to do uh, this review for, you know, accuracy and fairness and, um, you know, just to be able to make sure that it's aligning with um, everything that you're looking for. Um, so, yeah. Next slide. Um, yeah, sorry. Okay, so um, 
how would this actually look like then? So we're just gonna kind of again look at like how we could do this. Um, hold on, let me pull this up again. I'm gonna just do a, a new new version here. Um, so we again start with our rubrics, right? Um, so here we. Um, are asking to take on the role of a sociology instructor. So and I've made these a little bit different so that you can see that your prompts don't always have to look exactly the same. Like, you know, at the, stop, at the top here, we said, pretend that you're a sociology instructor. Here, we're just saying, take on the role of a sociology instructor. And um, we're going to specifically look at uh, sociology at a college for a diverse audience of adult learners and here you can implement too like we had a comment in the chat like how does it know if it's culturally biased or not how does it know if it's culturally relevant or not um and so we can actually input some demographics here too if we wanted to do that and talk about like what type of students we have in our course so you're grading an assignment on analyzing the role of culture in students' personal experiences. You will be provided the, the assignment instructions and grading rubric. Um, okay, hold on, let me, let me do this real fast. I think I actually had started this just so that you didn't have to watch me do it, but I might have messed it up. Um, Oh, here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna pull Claude into here instead. Okay, so um, we start with the original prompt and then I'm um, basically um, letting them know, um, please grade these papers and provide personalized feedback to each student. I will providing you with the student assignment. You're not grading the assignments based on your own fabricated information. Sometimes it likes to do this. Please address the students as you and yours and provide detailed information on the various sections of the rubric, including a comment section that offers positive feedback and feedback for improvement. Do not start typing anything yet. Next, you will be provided the assignment and the rubric. Okay, so it basically just lets me know that it understands what I'm requesting and then I'm providing the assignment instructions. So these were my, uh, my instructions for how it would look like. And then it's saying, thank you for providing the um, instructions. And then it's also asking for the rubric. And so then this is my rubric. Please let me know if you need clarification to the rubric. And I literally just took this rubric and copy pasted it from my, my LMS. So it looks super strange in here, but it still is picking up exactly what I need. So even though the formatting doesn't look great in here, it understands what I need to do. And I know this because of my then paper here and then how it is grading afterwards. So now that it's provided the detailed rubric, they understand the criteria, point allocations for assessing the key components of the essay. So we've provided the prompt, we've provided the actual assignment instructions, and we've provided the actual rubric. And then here I'm then providing the first student paper and I'm not including any names or anything into this because we want to make sure that we are again we're we're following our FERPA rules so this is just a paper without any names or anything like that <clears throat> so there's no tracking right and then um, here would be the feedback. So the overall score was 25 out of 30, and it's giving me the point values into each of the different sections. And then it's also giving some additional information. So you provide a clear description of your family's Christmas traditions, including details about the preparation of food, gathering of family, gift exchange, and late at night celebrations. And it does this for all. So even my theoretical applications, the evaluation of theories, writing, and Quality, and then it provides some positive feedback and then areas of improvement. So now what I would do is I wouldn't just take this face value. I would have always read the paper beforehand so I know exactly what it is that it's actually grading. And then um, now it's really just taking out these tidbits. Like, you know, I, I tend to grade a couple of papers first to make sure that it's following the same structure, but then now it's also giving me an area for reflection, uh, whether I am being, you know, fair in my own grading, right? 
And so I can go over this and look at the context, um, the application, the theories, the quality, and then providing the feedback. And um, if there is a way where it's providing really great feedback, I can just, you know, take it as it is and I can provide like my own little tweaks to it. Um, but then sometimes in the different areas, like uh, it maybe didn't do a great job in the theoretical application. So I can say you mentioned symbolic interactionism in passing, and then I can expand on this if I want to do that to help my students really understand. And then I would put this into that section of my rubric so my students know exactly which areas it is that they would need to improve on. Um, so that's how like I would utilize it for grading and how it would help me for the grading purposes. But it, again, um, it's not to replace you, it's just to assist you. And sometimes we um, there's certain areas we, we might not know exactly how we wanna say something. So this is a, also a great way to get those extra little nuggets, right? Like, oh yeah, this was actually a great way of saying this. I don't know how I would have said it or I probably wouldn't have said it as well or let's say this, but let's add to it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Zola. So now we're gonna talk. We're gonna kind of switch gears a little bit, and we're gonna talk about quizzes and exams. Um, and this is where a little bit of repeat from last week comes in. Um, but I just wanted to talk about some of the benefits of creating your quizzes and exams on chat or on any large language model, not just ChatGPT. Um, so a couple a couple years ago, I got a phone call from my uh, my chair, the chair of the department, and she said that essentially the nursing students had found had figured figured out a way to download and steal the test banks for a couple of different um, classes that they were taking for their pre pre, pre nursing, and they were selling those to. Um, new nurses that were in the program, right? So they were kind of recycling these test banks. And the way that they were able to catch them is, is that, I don't know if you guys know anything about nursing classes, but they're really hard, right? So the fact that like the same group of individuals was getting perfect scores on all of these tests was a really big indicator that something was going wrong, right? And so Initially, one of the, the protective layers that we used was the was the lockdown browser, right? But the lockdown browser doesn't, it still doesn't prevent them from memorizing test questions and test answers. So what I love uh, about um, using, you know, ChatGPT or Perplexity or whatever large language model I decide to use is, is that I can create new questions every semester and it doesn't take me you know, a hundred years to write, you know, a scenario question. Cause I don't, I don't like using those um, like memorize and regurgitate questions that give me the definition. I, I don't think students learn very much from that. Um, I want to see that they can apply the concept, not just that they're, they're knowing it. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm asking chat GPT to create these questions, I can ask for like really detailed scenario questions. And, you know, if I need 20 of them for a quiz, I might ask, you know, chat GPT to create 50 of them, right? And pick out the ones that I like the most. Or I might ask them to regenerate completely and give me a whole new set of questions if I don't like those. Or I can take pieces of scenario questions and I can add my own bit to it, my own feedback, right? And so this was, this is a really great um, method to reduce cheating, right? Because they're never going to have access to those questions. Um, now, I am going to talk about one small exception to that um, in a bit, but um, first I wanted to tell you about also about randomization. So sometimes I will allow students to use uh, their notes or their book to take my quizzes. And what I love about um, doing, you know, creating these quizzes through uh, ChatGPT or, or Perplexity is that I can ask them to put them in random orders, right? So I might take section one from chapter two, ask them to create five or 10 quiz questions, and then section two, and then section three, and then section four, and then tell me, tell them to scramble all of those questions up for me. And it's really helpful to be able to do that, especially because I'm going to show you uh, another video on how to like directly upload those questions as a test bank. Um, and it, what it does is it, it kind of forces students to have to do a little bit of studying because oftentimes if they have access to the book or to their notes, what they're going to do is they're just going to go section by section and they're going to try to find the answer that way. Right. And so this 
kind of pushes them, hey, I know it's open to open book, but that's really only if you really can't remember something. It's not meant to be the end all to be all, right? Um, the other thing too is is that you one of the one of the tougher things that I've uh, that I've had, struggled to do in the past is that little box in Canvas that you know asks you to give them feedback on right or wrong answers. Um, so ChatGPT or ChatGPT or whatever um, AI model that you're using will do that for you as well. It'll say you know hey you were right. Um, you know, and then it'll explain the answer or, oh, you know, you got that wrong, try again. Um, and it'll explain the answer for you. Just again, efficiency. It saves me a little bit of time from having to do that myself. And then that regenerate option. So I should say that, you know, for ChatGPT, if you click that regenerate button, um, it will keep the answer, but it'll hide it, right? So that original thing that it generated, it hides and then it regenerates it and you can go back. But some AI models will completely delete whatever it was that it generated, that output it that it originally generated. So if you like that, um, instead of asking it to regenerate, you can just say, oh, I'd like, you know, to, for you to give me a few more examples or to give me a few more test questions. OK, um, and then just a couple of reminders when you're creating these quizzes. So depending on which AI tool you're using. Oh. So I talked about that, the regenerate button. Um, the second one is if AI gives you a question, know that that AI has the answer. So I learned this sort of the hard way. I, I was having um, students look at scenario questions in class in groups, right? Um, so I gave them each three scenario questions and I told them, get in your group and talk about it. Well, one of the scenario questions they put into ChatGPT and they got the exact same answer. Um, and I don't block them from using artificial intelligence, by the way. So it was my fault, right, that I didn't say, hey, no using um, artificial intelligence. But it's just kind of a reminder that um, if you are allowing students to do like take home quizzes or you know, open no open internet quizzes, that whatever you create on these AI models, um, they have, you know, AI is going to have the answer to it. So they're going to be able to answer that question for them. So just kind of keep that in mind um, as you uh, format however you decide to do your quizzes. And then um, we're going to just show you this next tutorial video, which you guys um, will hopefully find helpful when creating your, your quizzes. And Ashley, that will be it for our presentation. We won't have time oh. for anything else because it's on oh. 1152. Uh, okay. Should we, should we not? Should we just, okay. So, okay. So some of you guys came last week. This is, this is an auto upload for the quiz. So you don't have to copy paste it. If you guys want to know how to do this, we won't play it so that we can, we can get through the rest of the presentation, but you can go to our YouTube channel and you can look it up. Um, it just saves a lot of time in terms of not having to like copy paste the answers. Okay. Okay. So, um, hold on. Let me pull some of this out. And um, okay. So the the last piece then that we want to talk about is assessment analysis. So this has to do with essentially like it could be your formative assessments, it could be your summative assessments, it could be so essentially like written material discussions, any written assignments, and it could be like your quizzes um, or exams that that type of stuff, right? So um, AI can actually assist you in making assessments inclusive and equitable because it can look at these different areas. So analyze test questions, check for accessibility, review exams for cultural bias, evaluate reading level of assessment questions to make sure that they are actually on par with what type of a class you're teaching. Um, assess difficulty and cognitive levels of questions. So again, are you if you're teaching an introduction class, you want to make sure that you're not using like crazy hard material that should have been for like a master's student, right? Analyze results of past exams and then generate new test questions. And so this can help you with, with the analyzed results of past exams. This can help you kind of look at then like if there are areas where your students have not been doing that great in, um, it can look at that and let you know, help you let you know that you have a couple of questions within your exams that might need to be reworded a little bit for clarification. And this is my why, or this might be why your students are struggling. So 
I am going to look or show you a little bit about this, but some of the things that AI would need to perform an assessment analysis would be your course topic and subject, your learning outcome, your grade level, your demographics of your learners. So you want to actually include what type of students you have in your um in your classes. So we're not just looking at culture and ethnic here, but we're also looking at age and gender, right? So we wanna include all of these things. And then if you have any particular instructional materials, we wanna include that too, your rubric or your criteria for grading. And then if you have it, any past exam data, you don't need all of these pieces all the time. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of how this would look like without all of these pieces, but, still just give you an example. So <clears throat> I'm just saying, please analyze this introduction to sociology exam for potential bias or accessibility issues. So this is a quiz that I've taken from my canvas from um, one of the like open educational resources, right? I've just copied the actual quiz and then I'm letting them know um, that I want to look for potential bias accessibility issues and then provide an audit report. The exam is for adult learners in an introduction to social course attached to the course learning outcomes, um, instructional materials and past exams for context, but I didn't actually attach these for the purpose of this because it would be it would take too long, but we can do that. Let me know if you find any bias in language, content uh, assumptions or scoring. I did attach the, the learning outcomes though in my text. And then here is the analysis. So it's basically saying the exam questions are generally aligned with the stated learning outcomes covering the major sociological perspective, key concepts and early sociologists. So it's talking about the language, content consumption, or con uh, sorry, content assumptions, scoring consistency, suggested revisions. So provide a brief definitional reminders of examples for key vocabulary words and question stems. Um, so it's actually giving me some ideas of how I could use this to improve. And then I'm asking, please further analyze each question in this exam. So it's giving me some additional information, whether there is something that I could provide. This particular exam though doesn't seem to have any issues. And then overall, the questions align with stated learning outcomes, content, no overt biases, and provide adequate content, context in most cases. So this is a great way to actually look at both your written assignments, your discussions, and your exams to see if for any reasons you might have implicit bias that you are not picking up yourself. And there has been instances where I've like, oh shoot, yeah, I should not be saying it that way. I need to reword it. So hopefully um, you found value in this. Um, I do wanna just show you real fast though that I sorry, that I do have um, all of this in here too. So these would be the different prompts for discussion questions, final projects, and for an exam. And then we can further look at our actual SLO alignments as well. So we would do the same thing, but now we're looking to align with our SLO. So we're providing the course names and topics just like we have before, the outcomes and prompts. And I believe that that is it. <laughs> barely made it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and actually, for your wonderful presentations, uh, uh, Rodrigo. Once again, thank you. Uh, 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 keep in mind that we will, you will be invited again, uh, with your permission, <laughs> to present. Uh, and uh, your emails will be full. Uh, once again, this conclude our uh, presentation for today. Thank you. Have a wonderful feeling and. Uh, See you next week. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.